Hi, this is Damon Pistolka, host of the Faces of Business podcast, where we talk to interesting people about life and business. We cover their backgrounds, obstacles they've encountered, and find out what drives them. Along the way, our guests share nuggets you can use to drive your success. Reach me directly, D-A-M-O-N at ExitYourWay.us, or check out our website, ExitYourWay.us, for more information. I hope you enjoy our show. All right, everyone, welcome once again to the Faces of Business. I'm your host, Damon Pistolka, and man, am I excited today because I've got machining legend Matt Goosey with me here today. Welcome, Matt. Well, welcome, Damon. It's a pleasure to be here. I've been looking forward to this for about a month now because we're uh, metal guys or have metal yeah. backgrounds, so it's going to be exciting. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's awesome, dude, because uh your your background is 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 really cool i like talking about that you're a midwest guy there and there in wisconsin and it man it's just good stuff because hey every time we talk we it has to come back to the packers it always comes back something with the packers <laughs> yeah see the hats right there <laughs> so we're ready to go with that and and b you're just an interesting guy i mean when when you look outside of outside of machining you're you're a uh, a referee for both is it football and basketball. Yeah, football, uh, high school and college, and then basketball just high school. Yeah, yeah. So, because is it didn't I see you're like Division three football certified for Division three yep. football coaching or I mean refereeing. Yep, that's that takes a lot of a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, everybody <laughs> thinks it's just uh, a little couple hours in the afternoon on a Saturday it's no it's it's a minimum of 15 hours a week yeah yeah it's crazy how much time that I mean because just I mean I just used to mess around just umpiring baseball games for little league and, and I mean just messing around with that's a lot of work and then then when you look at and then talk to other uh referees and and things like that it's 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 a lot of work it's a lot of work. And as you move up, that's why I saw division three. I know when you get in the NCAA, it's tougher, a lot tougher than high school. And then when you, you know, you move up in the divisions within the NCAA and then into the professional, it gets even, even tougher as you go. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's knowing the rules in the rule book all year long, watching video all year long, because you just, what if and what happens and you just know, you never know when that's going to happen. You got to be ready and be prepared. Yeah. Yeah. I've never been good at that because I get too excited with the game. It doesn't matter. I don't care if it's girls softball, you know, people playing marbles. I, I get excited in the game and I can't be a good, a good umpire referee because of that. Yeah. That, that was the hardest part for me to get over. Don't watch the game. You know, you got zones and areas you got to watch. And just that's the number one thing. Don't watch the ball watch, especially in the basketball. You, you watch your zones and, keep it there and just keep cool and calm Don't yeah let emotions so <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that would that would be that would be trying at times i'm sure because you get some get some coaches that really are, are push your limits i'm sure oh yeah you get in your phone once in a while <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah that's good that's good because i remember in just in the little bit that i like i said if i was a little bit in little league there's there's a certain age when when us as as males we we get to that age with kids and it, it we get we're a little bit more boisterous i would say than we are as as we on either side of that <laughs> i think yeah and uh it's interesting so but you're but that that's cool because you know that you have to in not only are you working on machining uh, around the year you're working on something else that keeps you both physically active because that's the the other thing i've had friends that were high school uh referees and they would tell me about that just the running that you have to do just to stay in shape to do that and you're staying in shape because not only are you a referee in in football and basketball you're also an avid cyclist yep that's that's probably been the best thing for me for the last 30 years it, it 
it's just it's the physical part yeah it keeps you in shape and stuff but it's also the mind and the, the mental part because after a hard day of work or a hard day of officiating or something yeah you gotta just gotta get your mind cleared out and yeah. oh is that, is that refreshing because where i ride you know if i see three cars on a 50 mile bike ride that's that's about the average where some people in the big city it's like five cars and two blocks yeah yeah, <laughs> so I'm yeah. Very fortunate yeah so how many miles do you ride your bike a week just um a given week at this time of year yeah i put about 300 three to 400 miles a week on wow 300 and so but it's you know back in the day when i had the old steel bike chromoly frame the thing weighed like 25 pounds nowadays yeah. bikes are 15 pounds and aerodynamic and the older i get it you know I need that advantage. So you got to put a little money into your bike so you can keep up with. <laughs> yeah. Well, you've got quite a bike. There's no doubt about it. I've seen the, seen the pictures of it and it is, it is something. And, and you're right. We've got, I was actually talking to a, a, a client of mine over the weekend. He had a charity event that we did and uh, he's an avid cyclist and he was explaining the, he's got, I don't know if you do this, got four or five different kinds of bikes because he likes to ride trails in the road and, and it, one's for the rain and, and how out here we have to have one for the rain, <laughs> but uh, as a special one, just, just for really unique situations. Yeah. Up here we have one for snow. <laughs> <laughs> Does it have a little ski in the front? No, it's just wide tires. I think mine are <laughs> four and three quarter inches wide. All right. What about three pounds of pressure in them five oh. whatever it depends on the it's more about tire pressure in the winter than it is any time else yeah i'm sure i'm sure so you you've been in machining a little while yeah a little bit a little bit <laughs> you you i was i was reading more about the background from of uh mrs machine and about how your your dad roger started it in 1986 and shortly thereafter in 1989 you you started with him and you guys have been really just tearing it up even you've, you've been tearing it up your dad uh went on to to found an educational program in the local high school which is super cool we can talk about that a little bit because i think it's that's really really incredible and and then you at the helm have just continued on and and really built it up into into the some of the things that you know and i met you i think last year or or, or early yeah last year something like that uh but uh you've been recently interviewed by fox news and on a lot of other places about helping bringing awareness around the employment uh challenges the recruiting challenges in the in the manufacturing machining industry and, and a lot of other stuff so i'm really excited to talk about this stuff so, so tell me a little bit about how you decided that you wanted to be in machining and and kind of those early days working with your dad in the in the in the business all right now it's my turn to speak um actually you know when i was growing up in high school you know my dad my dad had a we were like a hobby farm we had cows and and he had a he was a machinist and i always thought yeah. well, that's kind of cool what he does and he'd always tell me so when uh, we sold the farm back when i was in eighth grade ninth grade they uh, we moved to town and um, my dad worked at a machine shop and I worked at a gas station and that in the summer I worked in the farms helping hay and stuff. So I had mm -hmm. that, I had that farm background. And then one night I just, he started to ask, they need something to clean the floors. And I said, well, that's kind of cool. I can do that after school. So that's what I did. And I did that for a year. And then my junior year, I was going to be a senior. Um, that second shift, they asked me if I could run a, uh, LeBlanc Makino horizontal machining center. And I'm like, uh, you know, <laughs> that things are going all kinds of directions. And I'm like, I can just push the broom. And then the guy goes, oh, it's real easy. You just do this, this, and this, and you hit that green button. Oh, okay. Well, I'll give it a shot. So I did. And I was making these little ball valves. I can remember today, and I was putting a keyway in them. And I had the little whirly burr thing. I deburred it and filed it. And hey, this is kind of cool. I kind of like this. And so I ended up doing that for like the whole month of July. Wow. And, and you know, I was like, wow, this is kind of cool. So that year I took a um, – a program at the high school we had like a little cnc plastic machine 
And I learned a little bit about MG code programming. And then there was an old guy in that second shift that started telling me what this M code thing does and this G code thing does because it was all Greek to me. Yeah. And so my, the guy that owned the place kind of seen that. And he said, hey, I'll sign you up for tech school for free. You're going to pay for my school. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm in. You know, So we signed up. Well, what ended up happening in my senior year, he ended up getting killed in a car accident. And he's like, oh, man. And the family was from Chicago. And and he, he he liked to spend money. And he didn't have a lot of it. So the place was basically going to go bankrupt or shut. Oh. So, so they came in and said, okay, let's close the doors. We're done. Get yourself out of here. So we got all this expensive material like Hasselite, Stellite, and Monel. And I remember throwing it in my dad's truck and put it in his garage because they really wanted it out. And my dad was friends with the customers, and they just asked my dad one day if he could finish machining it. And there were just some shafts or some grooves and chamfer. To this deal, the self bend lathe that you put on your bench top. To this day, I have no idea how he held the tolerances on there. He had like 12 indicators going every direction, which way. I remember him buying all these indicators, and at that time, I just thought it was like a gas gauge, right? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know what it was. Now I do, but so he did it, and then they did a good job, and they asked him, hey, would you want to continue making these parts? And that's when my dad, the light went off of my dad's head. It's like, maybe I should start a company. So I'm a senior in high school. I'm, I'm graduated now. So I'm going to go to tech school. I signed up. I ended up paying for it. Yeah. And he started it and he wanted to be a woman owned business because that was like a government thing we always did. Yeah. So that's what, that's where the, that's where the MRS comes from. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, it doesn't stand for mass really smart or anything like, like that. <laughs> we actually, <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's there's been there's been abbreviations behind yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, ooh, yeah. More, eh, but oh man, it, it's it's meant to be a woman-owned company. Um, we used to have a girl named. We hired a girl part-time, Sharon. So it was used to be thought was Matt Ryder and Sharon, but that that really wasn't the case. So, anyways, we uh, my dad started it. My mom was a president, and the way we went, I went to tech school and got my degree. And dad, I'm out of here. There's nothing in this town. And then yeah. I moved to Hay about two hours north of here, back in the boondocks. I loved to fish and hunt at the time. And I got a job there, met my wife. And what started happening is I started coming home on the weekends, helping them on a Saturday. Well, I was working 50 hours there and, you know, 10 to 8, eight to 10 hours here. And yeah, I, I, that got old. Yeah. And, and <laughs> so I finally, finally hit my head and asked my wife to marry me. And she said, yes. So I was very blessed that she said, yes. <laughs> Um, so we got married in the summer of 89 and the day, my dad, we got married up there. And my dad come up to me and said, Hey, when you're done, you're going to come work for me. in like next month, aren't you? I go, no, I'm happy up here. No, you're going to come work for me. Well, that was in July, summer of July. So after him pushing me and I said, all right, I'll come work for you. And it was really a blessing in disguise because what happened, the reason, the main reason was my dad had suffered a major heart attack. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he was clinically dead. I mean, they, they were done. He was like, you're done. You're, you're. And they gave decided that's another whole story. And I'll get goosebumps and probably break down crying if I told it. But they, he actually came back to life. And so then I knew, OK, he's 42 years old, massive heart attack. And the outcome wasn't very good. And it's like, oh, I got to I, I, I better come back. So I decided to come back. And, you know, I didn't know if I was going to we're going to be in business for a year or two. I didn't. You know, I'm only 21 years old. Yeah. Damon. And I, yeah. I, I'm a machinist, barely machinist, you know, I, I still, I, I didn't, I could hardly machine anything. I mean, I just knew how to measure something and kind of, so we started doing that and, you know, he helped me and we got busy and I remember back, I just remember one day I just shut my machine off. I still have the, I still have the museum here at MRS. It's, we got a web lathe and a Bridgeport mill. That's my museum. I will never get rid of those pieces of equipment. And I just shut it off one day and my dad says, what are you doing? I said, where are we going with MRS? I'm happy. Just get back to work. And he just, he liked to poke the stick. And I said, no, dad, I'm going to grow it. You know, I guess uh, I'm young. I come here to grow it, not just to stay in here and, you know, follow your footsteps. And he says, all right, I'll back you. So I started knocking on doors and mm -hmm. I got, I, I got the phone hung up on me. Who are you? Mm -hmm. you know, we, we didn't have cell phones. So you got to remember that. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. It, so I literally had to hop in the car. I remember getting this big book, trying to get names and cold calling and, People didn't have time of day for you. But actually, one time I had a, a tool salesman that came in and said, hey, you need to call this place. I think you guys would be a good fit. 
So I hopped in the car and went up there and yeah, we were a good fit and we started doing work. And then fortunately my dad found somebody at the same time. So all of a sudden we went from nothing to like, no, we got to hire somebody and we got to buy more machines. And of course my mom's yeah. like, we're in my mom's garage. So we ended up moving out of the garage because my mom pretty much forced us out of there yeah. and <laughs> moved downtown. And, you know, we ended up hiring four or five people and that was going great. When it was this company it was a defense contractor and that was the time of the desert storm was going on. Yeah. Yep. And they received a um, a contract to make some um, uh, bomb parts for the B-52 mm -hmm. bombers, the ones that they just all kinds of them fly out. So we actually quoted two parts, and we received the order. And the, I remember the Army guy coming down and auditing us, and he walked in our little shop. And he's like, where are you making the parts? And I said, right here. And he goes, oh, no, you're not. He says, you got 30 days to clean this mess up. Because, you know, what was 5S? What was 6 Sigma? Yeah. What was all that stuff? Yeah. You know? It was just a cluttered mess. So when we we had thirty days to scramble, and we scrambled and and we we put the machines in there and we got it up and running. Very stressful time in my life, and I ended up you know I ended up taking parts of the cities in the middle of the night, in the morning, during the day. We had hired people, and we made it happen. And I guess that kind of made a name for ourselves, and that just led to more work, word of mouth. And I can remember going to one of my other customers, and I got all dressed up, suit and tie, and. I walked in there because it was a big corporation and he was like, who the heck are you? You know, And and I, I get presented myself. I brought some parts in and some paperwork and showed him what we did. And, and you know, the first words out of their mouth was, you know, we love your presentation, but you know, you're only 22 or 23 years old. Can we trust you? And, and so I'm like, okay, I, you can. And I did, you know, I had to, yeah. I mean, that's why I always tell people, if you're going to go into business for yourself, there's three things. First of all, you know, I guess you got to love what you're doing, first of all. Yeah. But the three things you got to do is you got to be ready. Be ready to jump in this three to five years, 24-7, 365. Yep. You got to risk everything financially. Yep. Put it all out there because capital equipment ain't cheap. And your family, you got to get together your family and say, hey, I won't, you won't be seeing much of me. You got to make sure they're on because, you know, if mommy ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. And and roll up your sleeves and get busy and that's really what we did and so during that yeah. time you know, during that time my dad had like i think i counted three surgeries he had with his heart and so i was there for that and it, it was nice for him he knew i was there yeah and so um yeah that's kind of how we got started and then i just knew one thing i i needed to hire smarter people in me i just i wasn't the smartest kid in the block. I wasn't no 4.0 student. I barely got through school, you know, but the reason I did is I just couldn't sit in the classroom and look at the wall. I mean, I just bored yeah. me to death. And all my teachers, that's not all, but a couple, one of my teachers came up to me one day and said, you know what, Matt, you know, this, this little t technical area, that's for you. Cause you're never going to make it college. You're probably not going to be pretty successful in life. And, and I, I looked at him and I said, okay, thank you. And, and I deserved it. I probably deserved everything he said. But you know what? That's stuck in the back of my head. And then that, and that's why I, that just drives me today. It still does drive me today. I just, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not taking no for an answer. Yeah. And so that's kind of what it kind of drove me to where I kind of got today. But it ain't what I did. I mean, I got to just get the word I because it's it's not me, Damon. It's, it's, it's the people that work for me and it's the people that help me. Yeah. And someday I'm going to write a book and I'm going to start putting names in there. Yeah. And I mean, I, I just have an awesome team. You know, I, I can't praise these people enough for what they do for me. You know, I just kind of stay out of the way now. <laughs> let, yeah. the place, let the place do it because they're better than me. They're smarter than me. And that's that. I think that's, that's one of the changes that people don't really understand as, as you're building the business, because you're so close, like you, you were machining in the beginning and you were making those parts and, and you were figuring out who was going to do what at a certain time and making that transition to where others take over pieces of that and continue to take over more of that uh, so that you can continue with the vision of, of building the business. It's very hard to make that change. Yeah, it is. It, so what really drove me into that um and well 2013 i lost my dad yeah and yeah. and i'm kind of jumping ahead here a little bit but me and my dad are like best friends they're like yeah you know we fall did we fight oh yeah because we were both machinists and we both <laughs> <laughs> we were thought a little different 
Yeah. Because by the time I learned the computer side of it, and he didn't really learn the computer side of it. He just, he knew how to make things manually. Yeah. But then there's a computer side of it where you can take a little bigger depth of cutter, a little, you don't have to worry about chips flying and hitting in the face and stuff like that. And he just fought, we fought about how to hold on to it, how to, how to, how to work, hold it, how to make the part. But you know, at the end of the day, we always called each other at night and said, we're sorry, tomorrow's a new day. And so I might, I lost my dad. It was just like, you know, you could prepare for it too. I mean, it was all these little false, false alarms, cry whoops, you know, you go uh-huh. to the hospital and yada, yada, yada. And finally one night, I remember being at a career fair in March and my mom called me and said, Hey, your dad's, it doesn't have any, you have hours because you better get down here in a hurry. So I sped down there and I went to the hospital and here he is sitting there eating ice cream. And I'm like, what in the world? And I'm like, geez, you know, okay, another false alarm. And actually, 24 hours later he passed away and uh, then it, it, it just hit me hit yeah i mean i wasn't prepared for it and so that's when i decided to okay the people i couldn't even walk into this place damon i just yeah. had emotional cry yeah I yeah do. basically sat in the chair at home for three months and of course everybody's thinking i need help psychiatrist yeah. and counseling and i said i know i don't need that but i had a lot of people come to me call me talked me through things and finally one day I made it down here and, mm-hmm. and the place was singing and I'm like wow <laughs> these people stepped up and and I was just amazed at this day I'm still amazed and, I, and that's when I said you know I'm gonna pay these people back somehow some way in some form I have to because if it wasn't yeah. for them I, I wouldn't have it so that's when I started doing the if you jumped ahead about three or four more years I started giving 40 percent of the profit back to the people here that's because they stay here and this place yeah. is just, theirs just as much mine. And, and that's, that's where it generated from. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, that, so that's, all, that's special to see your, the people there. Um, like you said, step up and do that. And you yeah. wouldn't see that in mer- very many places. And <clears throat> it goes to show, first of all, that you, your father um, really, ran a good business and cared for people in the first place. And then because they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have, they just would have stood around and watched everything go to hell if they wouldn't have really cared. And, and then what you've done since then to help uh, share the gratitude for that help is, is awesome. And I think that's, you know, it's, it's probably why you're winning the awards that you do. It's probably wh- why your, your business continues to produce great parts for many different people. And they come back wanting more because you do a good job. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting how the bad times can drive some good things. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've had, it, it's, it has a bit of tropical paradise. I mean, there's just as many bad stories as there's oh, good yeah. stories, you know, you know, yeah. our businesses. I can remember in one week, I lost uh, 90% of my customers in one week. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you what, whew, that don't make you sleep at night. But Yeah. Yeah. So has the, has the type of customers changed an awful lot over the years? I mean, have you switched many industry or is it, is it really pretty much stayed that, defense uh kind of thing throughout well, no it's it's changed you know defense the woman the the government stuff there just wasn't didn't seem to be money in it and yeah. then you started hearing these people buying parts from china and then putting their yeah. names on it and i think that still goes on today especially replacement parts people yeah. are doing some i don't know they're, they're not doing things right and i i just said yeah. i don't want i don't want nothing to do with that yeah i'm out of there so we just just went back to the commercial stuff and you know stuff that you know the you know, today, you know, we've got, an, I got an oil and gas real heavily right around the turn of 2201. Yeah. And I got my, probably got, I got a little, a little too heavy in it because, you know, I, I always say you can't measure it. You can't manage it. And yeah. Oh, I, oh, I could measure it, but I was just looking at the bank account instead of the, actually trying to manage it. Yeah. And, you know, 015, that kind of hit us a little bit, but yeah. Um, and all food processing, you know, food plower, that's kind of big right now. Aerospace, we got to that by mistake. Um, that's, <laughs> I, I had no idea how I'd get into aerospace, but we did. And I guess we got pretty good at it because everybody wants, you know, we, we're good at complex stuff. It, yeah. I, got a, I got a team of young kids here. They're, they're, they're not really scared of anything. 
they'll yeah. take it on. They'll, they'll get it done. They don't care. And the more challenging, the, the better they, the more they like it. But you know, then we got the people that just want to make parts and yeah. they do a good job at it. And, and they, once it's proven out, they can set it up and do it themselves. And yeah. So you, you the, now this is one thing and we'll get a little, little technical as much as I can get. <laughs> But because okay. I started, I started out, you know, literally about the same time my machining experience in, in a tool room and in an injection molding company. And I think it was 1980 had to be six, something like that. And uh, it was before CNC really was popular. And I was lucky enough to put the first uh, cam at that time cam or, you know, program in there it was old master cam you know and then you, we we did the started doing that stuff but the you talk about complex and the complex in the in the when you started in the late 80s to complex now talk about the change in that oh. yeah i tell people here you know we we get a partner that's challenging oh, i don't know if we can do that and i said remember five years i go i'll go grab a part i got parts laying my display case or I got a drawing I'll pull up and I'll go out there and I'll put it on the table and conference room and I'll say, remember this part? Yeah, that's easy. I'm like, ah, let's go back five years. Remember how we said we couldn't do that? Ah, <laughs> you know, yeah. white technology, how you can measure things and how, you know, our five axis, you just, you program, not, you put a punch a number in, you know, a 22 degree angle and boom, it's a 22 degree angle. It's not putting, you building a fixture plate, an indexer, and, you know, sign bars, none of that. That's all gone. Yeah. You know, tri trigonometry, I mean, I, I hope I don't have to ever do it because I think I forgot it all. It's yeah. just, just you go find a model or go throw it up in cam. But no, the, you know, the tolerance is also tight. You know, back in the day, if you could hold a thou and a lathe or two, that was pretty tight. And now two tenths is like, you know, that's like the norm in <laughs> most of the parts wow. we do. Wow. But no, that also brings in more challenges. Now you got to have a temperature controlled. You know, when we first started out, we didn't have air conditioning shop. We didn't have yeah. ventilation. We didn't have chillers on our coolant. Now, you know, when you start holding those tolerances, all that comes into play. Yeah, because temperature moves it that much. Almost. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the best way I put it, because some people don't understand metals move and stuff. And, you know, we have a railroad that runs through town. And I from the summer to the winter, that thing over a mile shrinks three inches from the winter or grows three inches in the, the summer and shrinks three inches in the, in the winter. So that's how much steel moves. And yeah. you know, just 10 degrees is an aluminum is like, could be a 10th or two. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't realize that either until one of the machining companies that I managed later on in my career, we did, I think the envelope was like 10 feet by four feet by three feet. And we would do, some of our stuff was like four inch aluminum and 16, 18 inches wide and, you know, eight feet long. And I didn't realize that you had to actually skin both sides of the material to kind of let it relieve stresses before you started actually machining anything out of it. And, you know, just strange stuff like that, that you only material, it moves, it just moves you. you it's crazy how you have to do that. And then, you, you know, it's just like your grandma's cake, you know, <laughs> you got the recipe, but if my grandma makes it or your grandma makes it, it isn't quite the same. It yeah. is close. It's all the ingredients are the same, but it, well, you can machine a job 10 times and that 11th time you get it from a different mill and it, oh, I, oh well, geez, it's horrible. <laughs> yeah. All kinds of problems. So, yeah. So what, are you, so you've, you've talked about the tolerances have gotten a lot, a lot tighter because of the, and of course the, 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 the ways that you set up machines, but what are some of the things that you see now that's really changing that you go, man, that is going to be cool in the, in the machining industry as, as that really comes to, comes to fruition and starts really working. Oh, added to manufacturing has kind of went a long ways. That's, you know, we, uh, you can machine something and all of a sudden you can hit program it to come in and add some ink and L to steel just in a certain area. We don't have to machine the whole part. 3D printing, that, that's coming a long ways. It, we're not really into 3D printing. Yeah. Um, that That's, you know, I don't think, you know, 3D printers, well, definitely going to, is going to, or 3D printing metal is going to be 
come up and fast. And it's going to be a thing of the future, but I still don't know if it's going to be fast enough to print out a couple thousand parts. In yeah. That kind of fashion. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 The, as far as cutting tool wise, I always, you know, two I always go back to is um, when them helical meals came out or, I mean, you, you take a full width of the flute length and you just start taking five thousandths and I call it peel meal. And you really peel it like a banana. You just mm -hmm. really fast where before, you know, I used to take a big depth of cut just real slow and beat the crap out of the machine. That that's amazing. I mean, that, that takes, let alone does it take time off the part, but the tool life, I mean, I used to, Go through end mills like in coffee cans full, and yeah. now I don't, the end mill lasts a month. <laughs> you know? Wow, that, that, that's amazing! And yeah, you know, and hydraulic holders and shrink fit holders, and we didn't have all that back in their 90s, you know. Yep, so that that's that's and then the coatings, you know, whoever thought of a coating putting a coating on a tool would really and that just the coatings alone, I, I can't. I'm, I'm a DMF guy. I love design for manufacturing. Uh, mm -hmm. I just, I see a part. The first thing I want to do is how can we make it better? Yeah. How can we, how can we cut costs? That's, that's just me. That's, that's what drives me. That's why I like to go for bike rides. I like that part. Yeah. And that's what goes in my head. And, you know, I had this one customer, he was high speed steel. And they're like, what the heck? You're still high speed steel in it. I said, let's put a coating on there. And, and they were taking these tool blocks pretty hard and EDM. And, well, you know, EDM is like, hundred dollars an inch to get edm yeah yeah i said just take that sucker we'll machine it out of a billet and we'll heat treat it and we'll throw a coating on there and it, that part went from there were like 30 inches of cut to that thing lasts like six months now and oh wow and they didn't like it very much because they couldn't sell replacement parts so yeah it, it, <laughs> it, it, that's the kind of stuff i like i like to do anyways yeah um, yeah and and you talk about the things like that when you said additive manufacturing and then machining something and putting some material, a different type of material right where you want it, I, I just can't even imagine. That boggles my mind, the, the possibilities by doing that. Oh, yeah. I mean, wow. that's, yeah, that's just like cladding in the oil and gas industry. You know, you used to rough machine it, you know, to send it out and get it cladded and then come back in and machine it. Well, that's three extra processes. But now yeah. you can, if you can do that right in the same setup, oh. And, oh, and, do yeah. it, and do it overnight. I mean, that's. I oh, think wow. That would be something. That would yeah. be something. Well, wow. it, 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 yeah, it, it is something already. So just. Yeah. Um, just get in, in mainstream mainstream usage and and it it is amazing. I mean, all the way you talk about three D printing. You know, I think it was a couple of years ago. Now they built that car out of a three D printer. Built a car or the body or whatever they did, the whole thing, and we're able to roll it. And, you know, it's just those kind of things are going to change the way, at least, as you said, it might not be for the production, but what you conceptually can think of and and make is going to be a lot different. Yeah, I mean, just yeah. to take a model and hand it to your customer, and yeah. the concepts, that's what, that's what we like about 3D print. You know, before we fixture and even, you know, how we measure things in our CMM, you can 3D print something just to hold on to it. Let alone yeah. 3D, 3D print it before how you see how you can machine it, you know. So yeah. that's just crazy stuff. Yeah. Wow. So when you think back and you go back into, you know, just learning what, uh, you know, what the first time you hooked a computer into the into the machine, now it's they are, they are part of the network. They they talk back and forth to the network and, and everything like that as well, right? Yeah. You know, we have computers in all our cells, so, you know, pretty much paperless yeah. as much as we can be. And, you know, I back in the early 90s, if you would have told me that, I thought you were crazy. Yeah. <laughs> but That's... it just, it's saving the process and that tribal knowledge. So if somebody leaves or you don't make that part for three years, you have everything right there. You have a document, you have process sheets, pictures, inspection sheets, um, the plan yeah. how to make it it's all there the programs are saved that's yeah. that's that's I mean, it's you, valuable stuff yeah everybody's pretty much doing that nowadays yeah but it's it's good though to be able to to see the industry moving forward and 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 where it, where it's come from so you can hopefully not repeat mistakes as much uh and but now this year it's been interesting with with everyone that you know we all hear in the uh, news about how 
COVID's affected, you know, uh, all these industries. And one of the things that I see almost across the board in manufacturing, yeah, it's affected the industry, but not like people think. Manufacturing in general has been going right through and can't find any people to work in the factories now to, to help them produce the parts. And this is something we talked about many times this year. And honestly, it's, it's I believe it's why you got interviewed on Fox News too, wasn't it this year about about the, the problem with recruiting and or hiring good people? Yeah, that, first of all, I'm still amazed some kid from a small town in rural Wisconsin could be making national news. That I would have... <laughs> I would have never, never dreamt of that. I mean, to this day, I'm still like, wow, you know, but, you know, I know I have a, I think I have a story to tell. That's what everybody tells me. I have a good story yeah. to tell. And I wouldn't be able to and do what I do because of people like you, Damon and Sam Gupa. I mean, you guys get, you brought me out of my shell. And I guess I'll go back to 2007 when I won the American Machinist Award. <laughs> I won this award and they came in and toured me and, and, uh, and they said, Oh, by the way, you got to come down to our conference in Cincinnati, Ohio. Okay. Yeah, sure. I'll be happy. Oh, but you got to speak for an hour. And I looked at him was like, I, I couldn't speak. I hardly talk on the phone, let alone speak in front of a bunch of people. And, yeah. uh, so I got notes and I practiced and boy, I, I got in the plane. I got in the plane, flew down there and I was so nervous. I had no clue what I was going to do. And all I remember this guy telling me, um, when you got 10 minutes to go, I'm going to stand up. And so you better hurry up and finish up. Okay. So I got up there and I had my notes and I started talking and what, what felt like 10 minutes, all of a sudden this guy in the back room stands up and I'm like, what the heck is he standing up so early for? Back of my mind, it's like, so I kept talking and all of a sudden he's going like this. And the next thing I know, it was an hour. Yeah. <laughs> and I had no idea what I talked about, but apparently I talked, that broke me out of my shell because if, I could do that in front of a bunch of strangers. I figured I could maybe do it in front of a bunch of people like I did today. Yeah. And, and when I did the Fox news interview, I had no idea what they're going to ask me. They, I remember right before about 30 seconds before we went live on air, Liz comes on and I go, Hey Liz, what are you going to ask me? She goes, well, I guess we'll find out in about 30 seconds. Won't we? Okay. So if I can do that, I can, you know, live <laughs> national TV. I don't know what they're going to ask me. The rest is, the rest is easy. And, yeah. and it, that really helped me in officiating, you know, it, it just keeps you cool and calm. And yeah, I guess that all helped me too. But yeah. So anyways. Yeah. So you look at, you look at the, the challenges of hiring people. You're, you're, do you, is it just that, that you don't think that people are considering uh, machining or manufacturing as a career choice or do you think it's just there's less people that are interested in it um well it's kind of all of above you know if i had that million dollar i could answer that truthfully and have that more on i'd probably be sitting in a hawaii beach right now but yeah it's a lot it's a lot of things really it's you know back in the 70s in wisconsin we had 2.1 kids per household today we have 1.3 Oh, so now, so now you're one one less person per household. Well, how many families you got? Um, in our 40 here locally in our, our school district of 42 schools, we have a thousand less seniors graduating today than we did wow. 10 years ago. So that's wow. a thousand less. Yeah, it's a thousand less students. And, you know, I last week I asked around to everybody I talked to just a question of the week. And I like to do that. So my question of the week is everybody's saying, don't get the wrong, the $300 extra doesn't help but i ask people how many people do you know that are sitting home getting 300 dollars? I, I bet you i i asked about over 200 people damon and only one two people could tell me that they knew somebody that was sitting at home so i, I just we don't have the people and the, the i think a lot of this work what harry mosler did came back to america and we just got kind of we're kind of caught with our pants down to be honest with you and you know <sighs> To getting kids in school, that, that didn't help the last 10 years because everybody said a four-year college or you're a loser, just like me. They told me if I went to, I'm going to be a loser. And so that mentality had to change. And that we've made, I think all of us manufacturers have made great progress in the last five years. I'm seeing a lot of cool things in schools locally and nationally. Okay. You know, and if you 
things like we're doing at Cardinal Manufacturing. And that's, and I tried to start my own school back in 2000, you know, and I, I failed at it. And I went to the fast food restaurants and I, cause I thought, you know, they, they didn't have a career path and I just thought they were good people. And I failed six years, six months into it. They're all gone. What did I do wrong? And that's when I met Craig Krakowski from a Cardinal. And he told me, Hey, I'm going to start a job shop up in high school. And I looked at him. I'm like, Ooh, I want to get, they just got goosebumps talking to him. I want this guy. I want to be on that guy's team. And, you know, like, like the Packers, you know, we got Aaron Rodgers. and you want to be on his team. <laughs> I, I had to throw that in there. Yeah. <laughs> if he plays this year. If he plays. Yeah. That's the question. But yeah. So, so Craig got a job at over here to leave Strom and he called us up and told us and he came and visited and my dad, Hey, what do you need? My dad always said one hand's for giving and one's for receiving. And yeah. oh my gosh, my dad had half the shop given to him and all their tools. And like, whoa, whoa, dad, we got the cart in front of the horse here. Just have to hold on. But, you know, like I said, if those kids go through that program and don't go to college or go to something else besides manufacturing, that's great. You know, that's something now they don't go to college and for manufacturing. And I think what I want to do and waste a bunch of money. But, yeah. you know, we're getting students out of there. And now that we've done that, we got other school districts in it and it's successful and it works. It, you know, like I said, it creates revenue for the school, for the program and for the students. The kids are getting paid to go to high school. I, you know, if I was at me in school, I'd be on, I'd be going to school every day. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, and people are either opening up, you know, bring people into your shop, show them what you do. When you start showing them a part that goes into a medical tool and what it does, that shows interest. You start throwing apart what goes down three miles down in the ground for drilling oil and gas, or you make a little chip or something that goes into a airplane or something, or a little yeah. bracket that yeah. that people don't understand what's behind those closed doors. And once they see that, and then you start telling the salary. It was yeah. funny. I, I had this insurance guy in here that wanted to give me my um my insurance quote for next year, and he started talking about workman's comp and salaries. And he says, "Oh, you guys make about thirty there." Hmm, no. You make about 40 and I go, no, they make about 50. No, they make about 60. And he goes, bye. If I buy this conversation, I may be working for you. <laughs> well, so, it's, it's, it's a, it's a fact. It's a fact of manufacturing is the skilled people get paid very well. Yeah. And that's what, that's the most underlying thing that people don't understand. Yeah. You know? And yeah. that's the thing I try to get out in the schools. And I just, you got to educate people. And you know, yeah. like I said, back in 07, 08, every, all the schools closed out there, got rid of the, uh, we don't need tech ed, you know, we don't have yeah. money for it because it's heavy capital equipment. Oh, yeah. And they started selling it or just pushing it back in a corner. And they thought service and computers, that's, that's you know, you're going to be fixing and working on a computer the rest of your life. And that's not, not the case. Mm -hmm. Well, actually here, I, I always tell people, we're, our machinists are the most underpaid people in America. They're like, oh, no, they're not. And I go, yeah, they are. Because look, at just like the things we talked about, the stress of material. You know, you're a chemist. You're a scientist. You're a process engineer. You're, you're a cutting tool engineer. You 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 got to know how to make the part. And it's like five things. And, you know, we're, these guys are making 20 to maybe $30 an hour. Yeah. I mean, and a plumber. Don't get me wrong, plumber. We need plumbers and electricians. But I hear they're making $40, $45 an hour. And, they, you know, they got a van full of tools. And it yeah. just doesn't make no sense. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, there's, there's a lot of things that, it, that, that will definitely be changing, I think, in the manufacturing world over the next years. Obviously, there has to be. I mean, the last two years showed us that, listen, you can't have everything made at the cheapest point of labor in the world because that'll hurt. No. And, and then I don't think really in the US they've, ever gotten rid of the, the, the critical things out of the U S um, which is good. And it's the, the amount of people retiring now compared to the amount of people coming into manufacturing, I think, as you said, uh, is, is, and then the amount of people that are even available coming out of high schools is, is going down. Uh, like, like you were saying there too, is a thousand less people, people graduating out of 42 schools in a year. That's a lot. Yeah. That's, that's a lot. And, and when you look at the, the demand side of things, I mean, we're, we're now have the, the millennials are 
bigger as a population than the baby boomers. Yep. And they're like in there, whatever it is. I was just reading something about this again the other day. I was talking about how they're getting into the house buying uh, age. That's why the housing shortage is, they said it might got, it might go on for quite a while, just simply because they're, they're moving into the house buying age now. And uh, even though the, the baby boomers are moving out, they're, they're a bigger population. So like me being a, whatever they're called in between those two, whatever it's called, uh, you know, that was s small compared to the two populations. And, and that is the people coming into to manufacturing. Now the, the millennials are a bit older than that. And the, the gen, whatever they're calling today, you know, I don't keep up with Z, that. Long. I think Z, Z. Z, there you go. Yeah. There you go. Uh, and uh, that, they're, they were thinking that, you know, they're going to be the next YouTube sensation or whatever, you know, it, it's, and, and realistically, I mean, I've, I've honestly, this is from my, my, uh, my son's 22 years old. Right. And, uh, I just had power go out for a second. Sorry. My son, it still stayed on though. That was, I was freaky. I was like, everything went dead for a second, but, but my son's 22 years old. Right. He's got friends that, that are, uh, so he's, what is it? Four years out of college or out of, out of high school. Um, yeah, he's got friends that are still still working jobs that they shouldn't be working four years out of college. And they could go down to the manufacturing places down yep. here and find a job that pays them better, that actually has benefits, that they don't have to work crappy, crappy hours. And it has a career path that they can actually make a life out of it. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, rather than working for somebody that's worried about paying, giving you enough hours that they're going to actually have to pay benefits and stuff like that, you know, and, and that's the thing that I always gets me fired up is like, man, there are so many more opportunities for people. And, and I'll say it about the four year schools. Don't go to a four year school. If you don't think that's really four year, don't go to a four year school for something that you're never going to get a job for yep. a job in. And, and, uh, but manufacturing, I, I'm glad to hear that people are talking with you about manufacturing, bringing awareness towards getting young people in manufacturing. I think the Cardinal, the Cardinal School example that that you guys have had a lot to do where, with there locally is awesome. I, I hope that there's others that are taking note of it and and maybe more, as you said, more schools participating in it because that. That's what we need. The kids have to come in and take this over. We're not going to be around forever. No, I, I'm blessed. My average age here is 32. And yeah. I have 47 people, so very blessed. Um, but what's, the, you know, what's the average industry age? Here? For, for, for the overall, for, for machining. Oh, 50. I heard 59. The other yeah. Day. So See, you're, like, you're, uh, you're lucky because of the program that's in the work that you've been doing. Look at the difference that that's made. Yeah, that's 15 years in the making. So yeah. that's that didn't, didn't happen overnight. And you yeah. know, we have if people want to learn more about that, we have workshops how to do it. And and awesome. I, I strongly attend just attend one of them. It's really cool. I like the yeah. live ones. You can meet face to face, but the last yeah. two were virtual. Yeah. So yeah. So when when how would they learn more about that if they wanted to about your, your uh, just. Just contact me um, okay. or type up Cardinal Manufacturing. Very good, and, and we'll uh, we'll get you set up. I think I'm not for sure when we're having the next one. I think it's October now. Oh, awesome, awesome! Yeah, because it is it is something that um, companies should consider. I mean, because in an area you could band together with half a dozen companies, a dozen companies from a given region, and and you could really power power yeah. the schools to 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 do two to do two things a you're going to create a stream of employees but you're going to give people which is more importantly a lifetime opportunity to do something they never would have thought about yeah and it's it's not that hard it's really it just takes a little time and that's the cool. yeah the benefits you get from it i mean I, I mean i'm just like a it's like a passion of mine i just get so excited when i get to see these kids and they get so excited because Nobody gives them attention. That's what kids want. The Gen Z wants attention and they want their input. So if anybody's out there wants to work, that's what they want. And yeah. And they're eager to learn. And yeah. 
Well, and and some some of the same people that that would really thrive in this environment that you've created in those schools are, like you said, some of the people that may not ever get attention other than 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 that. And that's a that's a great thing. I just think very cool what you're doing. Yeah, everybody's got a gift and talent, Damon. You just have yep. to help them find it. Yep. And once they do, you just let them go. Yep, they blossom. Like, yeah. Yep. Good stuff. Well, Matt, it's been awesome talking to you, man. I, I enjoy <laughs> our interactions around, and I, I just, man, uh, you're you're an inspiration in in how you're helping younger people find great careers in manufacturing. I really enjoy that. I, I love what you're doing in your in your company. I mean, I can't even imagine the the over the years, what that's been like, you know, the, the highs and the lows and the, just the, the things you've learned doing that, but it's, I'm thankful to be able to talk to you for a little bit here and, and thankful for you to be able to, um, just share. So hopefully somebody, if they, if they want to go to Wisconsin and work in a machining shop and they've got the experience that they're going to talk to MRS machining, because I think you probably got some things that you need to get done there. Yeah. Yep. I do. <laughs> um, but yeah, we could go on for another hour if you really wanted to, but I understand. I appreciate everybody's time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know. And and we will again in, in the future, we'll get on and talk about something else that, that we, you know, we get under our, that we need to leave, let out, I guess. But uh, I, I hope that the people that are listening today got to understand you know, more about you, more about the company, the MRS machining and the history and, and how you're helping people. And I was just happy that, that we could schedule the time. So Matt Goosey, MRS machining. Thanks so much for being here today. So if someone wants to get a hold of you, reach out to you on, on LinkedIn. Is that a good yep. spot? Yep. LinkedIn. It's just, it's Matt Goosey or just Google Matt Goosey and you'll, you'll find me. I see. There my, you go. So, there you go. Awesome. Well, okay. So before we get off, how, when did you ever think that you were going to be able to say that? Just Google me and I'll come up. Oh, well, actually, <laughs> probably like in the last year, personally. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Because you said that. I was never, yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking about that. That's, that's a cool. That's awesome, Matt. Great. Yeah. Thanks so much for being here today. Thanks for being with us. Yeah. Everyone that's been listening, thanks so much for listening. Love it. Put your comments in. And uh, if you want to reach out to Matt, go ahead and reach out on LinkedIn and get him there. Thanks a lot, Matt. We'll be back again next week after a short holiday break. We're taking off this Thursday and next Tuesday. We're going to be back again next Thursday and uh, with more interesting people that we're trying to talk to. And, and today, I'll even say it for Matt, go Packers. Go Pack. There we go. <laughs>